Okay, everybody, let's get started. Hello? I know I'm a different face from the faces you've seen in the previous two weeks. My name is Penny Jane Burke, and um, I'm the director of the Center of Excellence for Equity in Higher Education, which is based at the University of Newcastle. And I'm a sociologist of gender and education in particular, especially higher education. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you this, uh, today. Actually, it's not this morning now, it's noon, um, to um, share um, my excitement around the study of gender. Um, and I hope that it captures your sociological imagination. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about myself so you have a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I moved um, to Australia about Four years ago, full-time, I was here in 2015 on a part-time basis, and I came here to um, establish and develop the Center of Excellence for Equity in Higher Education, which was just an incredible opportunity to really try to do things differently around building equity and social justice, both at University of Newcastle, on the incredible legacy that exists at Newcastle, but also in um, supporting that work across the sector. Um, but my background, you can probably hear from my accent that I am originally from the U.S. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, in West Hollywood. And um, West Hollywood, at the time I was growing up um, in the 1970s, when I look back and think about um, my childhood and the kind of environment I was growing up in, um, and I've watched um, films uh, like Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is kind of set within that time. I just think about the way gender is con was constructed all the time around me, um, which really had an impact on my sense of identity, my sense of understanding, and my, I suppose my um, desire to somehow express a sense of social justice and push back on some of those representations of gender around me. So for example, Hollywood Boulevard at the time was quite a, a, a dangerous place uh, for a young woman. Um, it felt very precarious to be there. Um, lots of kind of pornography cinemas and things like that around, uh, around Hollywood Boulevard. Um, and that really had a strong sense, a strong kind of impact on me. Um, and then I went to England when I was um, very, very young. I was only about 20. And I went there um, um, uh, within the context of a violent marriage. And I ended up escaping from this violent marriage in London and living in women's aid refuges with my little son for about a year. And it was really there. I hadn't done any higher education myself yet. I left school early. And it was really there that I um, started to learn more about um, feminist theory and feminist perspectives. Um, and I was really um, kind of drawn into the power of being able to make sense of things, make sense of my own experiences through the lens of feminist theory and perspectives. Um, that that experience that I had personally was something about broader social structures and social discourses around gender um, that I wanted to understand better. And then a couple of years later, I was very fortunate that I was able to access a program called Access to Higher Education, um, which is very similar to the Open Foundation and enabling programs here in Australia. And um, I discovered sociology. I, did ha I had no idea that sociology even existed. So it was all very new to me. Um, but it was very exciting because it suddenly gave me a language to talk about some of the things I felt really passionate about, that I wanted to express the social injustices that I had experienced and that I had observed others experiencing, particularly when I was living in the women's aid refuge. Um, for such a long time, and, um, and the power of sociology, um, of gender, to be able to, um, to, to, to give sense to some of those wider experiences. So that's something that I'm going to be talking about today and in introducing you to gender theory and some feminist theory, um, ways of thinking about sex and sexuality through the lens of feminist theory and gender studies. Um, and I know that last week you were introduced to some of the sociological theories that are foundational 
um, in building um, sociology. And some of that um, gender studies and feminist theory has really built upon. So you'll see some resonances and connections from the lecture from last week, I hope. Um, but the, the studying and the theorizing of gender from a sociological perspective is very exciting because it really enables us to dig down into our experiences. Because what I would like to start off with and arguing for is that gender really matters. Um, it's more than just our, our um, personality or a sense of identity. It's actually about the histories of institutions the histories of certain practices, of certain ways of constructing the world um, that matter to all of us, um, no matter what our identity is or our sense of self is, it shapes our lives, it's, it shapes the social systems and cultures profoundly um, that we experience in our everyday um, lives. So I hope that this is really exciting for you and that you can make lots of connections uh, with some of the ideas that I'll be presenting and talking about today. So um, we're going to divide today's lecture into two parts. So the first part will be really thinking about the distinction um, that uh, sociological theory makes between um, sex and gender and why that's significant, um, different kinds of perspectives around that, um, notions of gender stereotypes and why they're important in our lives, and different theories of gender. And then we'll have a short break and we'll come back and we'll think about um, masculinities as a, um, as a very important strand of gender studies and what that has to contribute to understanding around sex and gender. Um, concepts of patriarchy and what that means. Um, different feminist theories and thinking about sexuality and gender diversity um, in relationship to contemporary feminist um, and um, gender studies um, theories. So, um, importantly, um, this distinction between sex and gender helps us to really bring out the ways in which often we take gender for granted. Um, gender is often seen almost as a natural thing. Um, that is innate in us or that we're born into. Um, so by making the distinction, and this is not um, unproblematic, but it helps to bring attention to um, the social nature of gender rather than the notion that it's biological. So sex refers to the biological and physiological differences between human bodies. So for example, male and female. Whereas gender helps us to pay attention to all that is social and cultural, um, the psychological qualities that are constructed and then projected upon human bodies. So we might think about that, for example, um, through the lens of masculinity or masculinities, because actually it's incredibly diverse and, and, um, and fluid and dynamic, and femininities, and how those play out in our, in our cultures um, and shape our, our sense of identity. But as I said, it's not just at the personal level. What's really important about this is thinking about how this is structured into our social systems, into our social cultures, and into our social institutions like family, uh, like um, schooling, uh, like higher education, like work, paid work, and so on, the labor market, and so on. So how does this make a difference um, to, to, to revealing um, how gender structures our, our experiences, our life experiences, and also um, structures the institutions and the practices that are taken up within them? So why study gender? Well, I've already kind of pointed to this. Um, but you know, one, of, one of the interesting um, aspects of this is to, stop, to bring attention to how we often think about ourselves individually, or we think about, about ourselves through the psychological lens of personality. And we often aren't able to think about our relationship between our personal experiences, our personal identities, and the ways that that is interacting all the time in our social relationships, 
and with social institutions and social structures within our communities, um, across society, and with each other. So in thinking about interactions, I'd like you to think about the notion of, um, of relationality, the idea that gender is formed in and through relationality, that idea that we understand who we are often as opposed to how we understand somebody else. It might be that we identify with that other person or that other group of people. So for example, if we're constructing our gender around being a boy, we might understand that in relation to other boys, but also in relation to those who might identify as girls. Um, as in opposition to or different from being a girl. So, you know, it's really important to think about that interaction as a relational thing from a sociological perspective. Um, so gender not only shapes how we view ourselves, but how we view others, how we make sense of who somebody is um, and, and who somebody isn't. Um, and so we tend to... Um, when we see somebody, we tend to read them. We tend to read their bodies in gendered ways. So we tend to see how they look, how they dress, um, their body language, and all of those kinds of things that are perceived as innate or individual but are, are also formed through histories of ways of being, histories of practices of being a boy or being a girl, for example. Um, and also, we want to understand through gender studies, this is very, very important, how power plays out. And there are different notions of power, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we think about different kinds of theories of power, and you've already done that last week in some of the foundational theories um, of sociology. Um, but power is really important to think about. Is it something that we might think about as something one group has and another group doesn't have? Or do we think about it as something that is constantly being struggled over or generated within social spaces? So I invite you to think about that question. And tied into that are questions about resources and who gets them. So in my field of equity in higher education, this is often crudely reduced to a question of, should we give resources to, to women or should we give resources to, to men? Um, without any kind of uh, thinking through the complexity of um, power and how that works in different ways for different people um, who are not just men and women. Um, and how gender works and how resource allocation and those kind of policy decisions have real effects for groups of people in, in different kinds of ways. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, a sociological view is what's very important about it, as, as I said earlier, as, is it moves us from only looking to the individual to looking at social structures and how we... Um, I suppose, produce our sense of who we are within those contexts of those social structures, that doesn't mean that sociology necessarily argues that, um, that we have no agency, that there's nothing we can do about those structures, but it's to acknowledge that those structures do matter and they do make a difference to our lives because we're constantly negotiating those structures. So how we can think about how structures themselves are gendered, how they um, generate and produce particular notions of gender roles, gen gender rules, gender expectations, um, gender opportunities, gender resources, and so on. So sociology um, really challenges the everyday taken for granted views of being female and male in society, as I said, that are often just assumed to be natural um, or, or are um, not necessarily tied in with how we think about um, broader social institutions and social, social structures, that we often think about it as very individualized rather than as embedded in um, our, our social structures and our systems. Um, the important thing about sociology is its focus on the constructed nature of gender, that gender is constantly being constructed. That doesn't mean that it's fixed 
or that there's only one notion of gender at play. Actually, it's quite fluid and dynamic, um, but it's to bring attention to the social construction of gender um, and, and what that means for the ways in which we understand who we are and how it um, might constrain um, or marginalize particular identity positions. Um, and it recognizes that gender does not intrinsically belong to um, a male or, or a female body, that gender is, um, is a socially constructed dynamic um, that's, that's out, outside of that um, biological explanation, but it's tied in with it because the rules and regulations, expectations, and ways in which social structures um, constrain those kinds of things um, make possible um, particular identities or make it very difficult to take up other forms of identity in some contexts. And we're going to talk a little bit later about patriarchy and what that means. And again, that notion is not just one thing. Um, again, and there's lots of different views of what patriarchy is, but patriarchy brings attention to a social structure in which um, being male or female um, matters, um, but also gender matters in terms of how power um, works, how power is circulated within those institutions. So let's look at um, some different kinds of ways of thinking about perspectives on gender, how gender is, gender is produced, and how gender inequality or inequalities play out. I, I like to think of, of these things actually in the plural because I don't think that they're fixed once and for all. I think they're always being struggled over. But you might recognize some of these perspectives from your lecture last week. So I think you talked about functionalism. Um, you talked about the work of Durkheim, for example, and how um, functionalism is, is focused on notions of social order, social function, how different roles play out in society to keep harmony, to keep things working together, almost like a, a, a body, you know, the way that the heart and the liver function to create a sense of health in, in a particular body. That's how kind of the body of society is seen by functionalists. So in, from a functionalist perspective, the argument might go that gender inequality is useful as a mechanism for usefully dividing labor and allocating rewards. So that might rest on notions of, for example, um, a male breadwinner um, or a, a female um, caregiver, which is, might be argued from a functionalist perspective as, a, as a, a, a functional role in society to ensure that we all know what our roles are and that um, society works, um, works well. Whereas conflict um, theory, which you studied last week, I think, in terms of for example, the work of Karl Marx as an example of conflict theory and as kind of the foundation of conflict theory, uh, theory would see gender much more as a conflictual space, a, a space in which um, uh, there is uh, a struggle over power um, and in which gender inequality is a way of structuring social stratification and difference particularly in, in which men um, tend to dominate, men tend to have more power. Um, so this kind of um, theoretical framework might see power very much as uh, within the hands of one group and out of the hands of another. So, you know, um, flowing from that, you might see um, uh, women as a class, you know, women as a class themselves kind of struggling against men as a class. Um, and key concepts around that are notions of, for example, subordination, that women are oppressed or women are subordinated in society, or notions of false consciousness that have flown from Marxism. The idea, particularly in what we call second wave feminism, um, which really emerged in the 60s and 70s, that women got together, and one of the kind of origins of, of current 
feminist theory is that women got together and they started to share their experiences of oppression or subordination, which they saw as individual experiences. But as they discussed these, they, they raised their consciousness and they saw that there were shared experiences amongst women um, that led to a women's movement, that led to that sense of solidarity uh, between women as a group to um, fight for women's equality in particular. So that's conflict theory. And then you also talked about um, symbolic interaction um, in terms of uh, uh, Weber being one of the foundational theories, but also you talked about the work of Mead. Well, gender theory kind of builds on that, those notions of symbolic interaction, many other um, theorists as well. Um, and sees that in terms of the kind of everyday interactions and the relational that I talked about earlier. More at the micro level. Do you remember last week you talked about the micro and the macro? The micro in sociology is just as important as the macro. So it doesn't take away um, a focus on individual and personal experiences, but it understands those personal experiences in relation to wider macro structures. Um, but it's the way that gender inequality might be transmitted from generation to generation. So for example, we might learn what it is to be a woman um, from our mothers, or we might learn what it is to be a man from our fathers. And that kind of understanding of the way that gender is produced and sustained over time, over generations. And in those, we're going to talk um, in particular today about stereotypes of gender and also about how those stereotypes then form um, our sense of our self-definition or our sense of identity. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about functionalism. So um, I, I can't remember if you talked about Tal Talcott Parsons yet. Talcott Parsons in particular, who was a functionalist, developed the idea of the nuclear family, which I think most of you are probably aware of. It's quite a, um, a, a, um, a, a common and, and well understood concept that has a lot of power in our society, I think. This idea of the nuclear family, the idea um, that really entrenches a notion of heterosexuality, the idea that there's a mother and a father and probably around two children um, being kind of the norm and a function of society, um, and the, the idea within this view that men are just better suited, they're naturally suited for this role of providing, being providers of the material needs of a family. Um, and, you know, all sorts of structures emerged from these notions, like, you know, the kind of breadwinner salary, that perhaps we've still seen the legacy um, all these years later in terms of uh, the gap, the gender gap in pay. Um, and meanwhile, within this role, uh, within this viewpoint, sorry, women are better suited for, you know, providing caring, uh, playing a caring role in the family, providing emotional support, being nurturing, um, being more kind of emotional and also aesthetic. Whereas when we think about conflict theory and gender, um, conflict theory focuses on how historically how have men had more access to society's resources and society's privileges, like being, for example, in key influential positions um, through senior roles in society, like being a judge or being a politician um, or being, um, you know, a chief executive um, and so on and so forth. Um, and that it's also, arguably, in, within this theoretical perspective, in the interests of men as a group to maintain their dominant position and to resist um, trends towards gender equality. And some of the kind of analysis around that might be, for example, some of the backlash against feminism um, that particularly we saw, I think, in the... Um, in the 90s and early 2000s where feminism almost became a bad word 
that women were often afraid to call themselves a feminist because the broader narrative was often um, weaving a, a narrative around the dangers of feminism, undermining um, the interests of society, but actually the, the argument would go um, that this was in the interests of, of men um, who um, enjoyed the benefits of society's resources and privileges and, and didn't want that to change. Whereas symbolic interactionists really focus on how um, gender is produced in the everyday, uh, everyday kind of encounters in our lives. That might be through our peer groups, for example, um, through the ways in which we understand processes of becoming socialized in particular gender roles, um, the ways in which the different kinds of texts or images or media and film, um, music and so on, portrays gender and how that those everyday interactions um, form our sense of what our roles are in society um, and again, how we understand ourselves as gendered people, as, as, um, as, as gendered. So what are some of the stereotypes around, um, around gender and masculinity? Um, I think that some of these would be quite familiar um, to you. Um, so gender theory brings attention to the way that social stereotypes generate our understanding of our identity, um, but also our behaviors um, and the ways that we, um, uh, that certain roles in society have been historically associated with masculinity. Not only roles, but also um, traits or attributes. And I think this is really interesting because on an everyday basis where we're taking gender for granted, we often just think about our gender as our personality. But this helps us to see that gender is also outside of us, as well as in our bodies. So we, you know, we might embody masculinity in the way we dress or in our body language, but it's also outside our bodies in terms of those attributes that historically have been associated with masculinity. So those kind of historical attributes, I would argue, with other feminist scholars, um, carry kind of very long-term significance in our imagination about who a person is and what they're capable of being. So if you think about, you know, some of these stereotypes around being strong, being protective, being able to defend your family or your country, um, being assertive and being competitively um, driven, um, those attributes are often not named as ones that are gendered or that are associated historically with masculinity, but they are, um, feminist theorists and gender studies theorists would argue. And if they are, what does that do in terms of the ways in which um, certain decisions are made about the appropriate kind of person for a, a particular role? Um, a policeman or a, um, a fireman as might be an example that we've had to kind of push back on and, and reconstruct um, and, um, and, and think very carefully about what kinds of people can take up those roles in society. Other kinds of stereotypes are, you know, the notion that um, mas masculine people don't really care very much about their appearance. They don't take much time thinking about the way that they dress, maybe, or the, they're not interested in fashion or makeup or jewelry. Um, that they're very um, rational and logical, and they tend not to be emotional. So, you know, an example of that is being socialized into thinking that if you're a boy, that, you know, boys don't cry, that boys don't show their emotions, that it's not acceptable for, you know, a boy should be tough, and, and that's how they should be. And the other important one, I suppose, is, is this notion that um, masculinity tends to be associated with the notion of high libido or being preoccupied with sex. And I think that that, if we start to analyze that, that has real kind of implications for how we understand 
um, gendered violence, for example, and how we understand um, uh, social phenomenon like um, sexual violence or sexual harassment, um, and so on. And then, similarly, we can think about the the ways in which attributes historically have been associated with femininities. So some of these, again, might be really familiar to you, that, um, again, we might not name them as feminine attributes, but historically they have been associated with female bodies and with notions of femininity. So the idea that, um, that women are naturally uh, understanding, or that they're soft, or they're caring, or they're nurturing. And I think this is really interesting because as a scholar of higher education, I'm quite interested in how that then extends into some of the language we use around soft and hard sciences, for example. And when you look at soft and hard sciences, you tend to also see that um, that the student body tends to be dominated by women where the subject is seen to be softer. Um, so for example, in education, nursing, social work, and so on. Whereas where um, the, the subject is seen to be hard, like physics or engineering and so on, you tend to have a majority of of um, male students. So these attributes tend to have social implications in terms of who participates in what and what is seen as appropriate. Other stereotypes include um, you know, this notion that women tend to be preoccupied with their appearance. That has ramifications for how, how um, girls are taught to feel about themselves, what, what is seen to be valuable and to see, seen to be important around beauty and, and appearance and so on. And this notion of femininity um, that, that you know, has a long history um, around the idea that, um, that women tend to be intellectually limited, that they tend to use their hearts rather than their heads, um, that they tend to be irrational um, and useless at practical activities, unable to do anything mechanical, for example, or technological and so on. And that they're much more preoccupied with romantic forms of, of love rather than sexual forms of love, which again has real implications when we start to analyze um, the impact of that on, on different lives. So um, these, these are all gender stereotypes. And as I say, they're not just, it's not just that they're stereotypes. I think that they also have real kind of power in terms of um, how we imagine who a person is and who a person can be. So they have real implications in terms of constraining possibilities, um, fixing people into roles, and fixing expectations around um, aspirations or choices and so on. But of course, in real life, nobody really fits any of these stereotypes. You know, we can't be boxed in. This is not the way um, that we experience our lives. It's the way in which the broader constructions of gender, gender play out in terms of our expectations of both ourselves often, um, but also expectations of us, of other people, and our expectations of others as well. Um, so that's what's, what's really important about understanding those stereotypes. Um, and as I have already said, we often think of those as, you know, it's just natural, that they seem to be natural. Um, and that um, quite often um, we might try to struggle towards meeting those expectations, you know, being a good enough mother, for example, or being a good enough sister, or being a good, being the right kind of boy. Um, and an, an example of this within my field is where um, scholars have looked at how masculinity often um, uh, plays out in terms of boys' experiences of school, where boys are often being almost coerced into um, presenting themselves 
um, in, in particular kinds of way that go against what is seen as a good student. And for those boys, it's quite difficult for them to negotiate the different gender rules and expectations around being a, a good student, um, getting your head down, being disciplined, being organized, and those kinds of things that have often been historically associated with um, femininity, and also being, you know, accepted by other boys at school, and having those kind of um, peer groups um, that are thriving at the same time. So how do people negotiate these different gender stereotypes in these different contexts of their peer groups and also the institutions that they have to follow the rules and they have to learn what it is to be a person within those um, sets of stereotypes and expectations. To kind of extend and build on that, um, there's this idea of the natural complementary of gender that um, we often relate stereotypes in relation to what is seen to be kind of natural oppositions. Um, and those oppositions are often just related to the things that, um, that we can see as natural, like night and day, um, yin and yang, positive and negative. And this way of thinking about gender and the natural complementary of complementarity of gender really helps to reinforce some of those social constructions of binary notions of gender, that gender is just an opposite. It's just two separate groups, and that's the way it is. Um, and those are kind of the, the, the norm of how we should conform in society. So it, it, it works towards a notion of heterosexual normativity um, in ways that um, uh, can be really unhelpful. And it also tends to over-essentialize the way we understand gender. So the, you know, for example, the idea that all girls naturally want to become mothers or um, all women naturally know how to be mothers, which puts a lot of pressure um, when you're in that role and you think that, what's wrong with me? I don't know how to do this, you know? I'm supposed to know this naturally. So this idea that it kind of essentializes what it is to be, a, to be feminine or to be a woman um, puts, puts a lot of pressure on people. Um, it also, I think it really is an important device that hides power from view. It hides, you know, the way in which power is struggled over. It hides the way the division of labor, say, within the family, works in particular ways to um, hold up um, stratification in society, um, to kind of reinforce the notion that there is a, a kind of pay gap for a reason. Um, and, you know, it hides power from view. It, it, it helps us to not see it. It helps us to not see how power is playing out in terms of how we're constructing who's an appropriate person for this kind of role and who's an appropriate person for that kind of role, um, what it is appropriate to be. So how is gender then developed? Um, so, you know, some um, theorists, particularly, for example, sociobiologists, might see these traits um, that I've talked about as biologically determined, but sociologists tend to agree that gender is socially learned. It's not something that's innate or, indeed, um, essential. <coughs> um, so um, Gender socialization is a really important concept in understanding, you know, the processes in which we might learn um, gender roles from a very early age. So I just wanted to stop for a moment and get you to reflect just for a minute about an example in which young children might learn early on about, about gender and behavior. Very happy for you just to have a quick chat with the person next to you or just to jot down some notes to yourself. Think about, you know, an example in which young children learn early on about gender and behavior, just for two minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to bring you back. So, I mean, one of the things that really stands out in my, my mind about this is, you know, just as my ch I have three sons, and they're all grown up now, but when I look back to when they were really little, I remember my three sons, you know, we had a, a catalog um, that in England, the store is called Argos, and the catalog was divided for the children's toys into boys and girls. Um, categories. So the, the boys category, the toy categories were all coded in blue and the girls were all coded in pink. And my sons knew very, very early on that they should only be looking at the boys pages of the catalog. That was the appropriate thing to do. So despite um, my interest in feminist theory and gender studies and talking about these things at home, I think the power of this is that it's often um, these forms of socialization are at play much more widely than just the, the immediate interactions you have in the home, although those are also very important. So, you know, so very early on, my boys were learning that this kind of color coding, this idea that boys equal blue, <laughs> girls equal pink, um, that girls play with things that they shouldn't play with, like dolls, um, or they wouldn't be wanting to pretend to be a princess, whereas, you know, um, boys should be playing with trucks, or they should be engaging in um, sword fights with toy swords and, and, and things like that. So that's a form of socialization that happens across social, different social sites, um, across media, across... Um, uh, marketing across schooling and in, within the family as well. So in, a, in addition to this, we are also um, socialized into um, forms of, um, uh, of heterosexuality. So it's not just about the way that gender plays out, but how gender and sexuality are deeply entwined in the construction um, around um, gender and se sexuality. And again, what is seen as normal, um, what is seen as appropriate behavior, and how that's regulated through our social institutions and through these different practices. Um, so socialization, as I said, is not only um, taken by parents, but also uh, across all these multiple social sites. Um, it happens um, very much, again, to bring back that concept of relationality, that it's not just an individual thing, that it's through our relationship with others, with social institutions like family and school and, and the media, that these socializations play out. Now that, again, that's not to say that we never, that we just conform simply, or that we're just fixed into these, or that we never resist them but it's to understand that these things are powerful. They're powerful sites of social, of gender, social, gender and sexual socialization. Um, and the other important part of this is the idea that socialization isn't a once and for all. What gender studies and feminist theory really bring attention to, which I think is really important thing to think about, are notions of becoming. That it's not just that we are but that we're in a process of always becoming through our ongoing interactions within these different social contexts so that we're constantly negotiating our sense of gender and sexuality across and within these different social contexts. And that continues on, and it's fluid, and it's not necessarily a fixed thing. So what are these... Um, processes of gender socialization. So, um, you know, these are different kinds of um, ways in which we might be, our gender and sexuality might be regulated and controlled, or we might be shaped in ways that we see to be natural, but are actually being generated or produced socially. Um, so those might include physical sanctions and rewards, 
um, being a good girl or being a good boy might play out in different ways within our schools, within our families, in which we get rewarded for the kinds of behavior that is seen to be appropriate uh, within those spaces. Um, so I, I was trying to think of some good examples of that, and it, it could be things like even a beauty pageant, for example, um, where you know little girls are being encouraged to um, compete in a beauty contest, uh, pageant, and they're rewarded for their beauty very early on, um, which has implications for how girls see themselves. Um, so that might be one kind of example. Or another example might be being told off as a little boy because you cry about something and you might be told, no, 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 you have to be tough and you have to be strong. You shouldn't cry. Little boys don't cry. So that might be another example of the ways in which we're socialized into a particular set of behaviors that are seen to be appropriate um, for the kind of person that we're being constructed to be. Um, so that kind of uh, overlaps with the idea of verbal encouragement or discouragement, the kind of things that we're told we should do or we shouldn't do, or the kinds of things we should be or shouldn't be. Um, I, um, I was a ballet dancer in my first career, a classical ballet dancer, and for many years I taught ballet. And all of, my, all of the children who used to come to my ballet class were all girls. I could never get boys into my class. And I used to play a game with the girls where they could just improvise and pick whatever music they wanted and do a dance and be, be whoever they wanted to be. And the other girls in the, in the class had to guess who they were. And they were often wanting to be butterflies or princesses or fairies and so on. And I would try to encourage them to think kind of outside of those gender stereotypes. And then another example of gender socialization might be the ways in which celebrities or role models or key significant people in our lives um, show us the kinds of behaviors that we might want to take up within a particular gendered identity um, or um, sexual identity, and then we imitate those from, from a very young age. And as I said, <laughs> excuse me, as I said, um, there are multiple sites of socialization. So this is very complex. It's not that we just learn something once and for all. We're kind of moving across these different social sites. And in those, we're either being um, particular kinds of um, forms of socialization are being re reinforced, or maybe um, they're being kind of um, pushed against, depending on, uh, on the context. But but largely, they're probably being reinforced quite a lot of the time um, within the primary side of socialization, which would primarily be the family, for example, or secondary through school, or tertiary through all of the different kinds of um, engagements we have with our peer groups, um, with people we don't know but might be significant to us for various different reasons. I named celebrities, for example. Um, or different role models, and also the media. I think that there's no question that masculine and femi feminine behavior is portrayed in a highly stereotypical manner in all forms of media. And so I'd just like to encourage you just to have a look and just to think about when you're watching a film or watching a TV program or you're looking at a magazine or you're engaging with music videos, just have a, just have a kind of analysis. Sit down and think about what are the gender stereotypes that are being produced within that or are they deliberately trying to disrupt those gender stereotypes? Just have a think and how often is it that you see um, particular forms of gendered stereotypes that we talked about being reinforced again and again in different kinds of media. And I'm not going to stop and play this video now because I don't think that we have time to do that, but please do watch it. Um, it's really good, and it really does kind of give that sense of, it's, it's about seven minutes long, I think, and it's, it gives that sense of how this plays out in marketing and how companies are so astute at recognizing the ways in which these gender stereotypes play out 
and they can really kind of prey on the expectations and also the identity work that people are engaged in doing in terms of being a man and getting the right kinds of products um, and not shopping in the wrong aisle or the wrong category and so on. And, you know, they talk about how um, particular products might be almost identical or identical, but they market them as, as feminine or masculine, and that increases their sales. So it's, it's a fascinating video that kind of shows up these very concealed practices around how we um, engage in gender politics, really. So this idea of um, Weston Zimmerman's of doing gender is absolutely um, kind of groundbreaking in the sense that it really helps to shift our focus from the idea that we are a gender to the idea that we're doing gender, that gender is constantly being made through the ways in which we're doing it. So whether that be the way we dress ourselves or the way in which we speak or the ways in which our body language is um, or the different kinds of friendship groups we have and the practices we have around what we eat, what we drink, the kinds of movies that we want to watch and so on, those are things that we do so it shifts the idea that gender is not a noun. It's not something that we're born into. It's something that we continuously make through our practices, through our doing, through our, um, through our behaviors that are being read off by others to make sense of who we are. So we're providing cues that are consistent with normative expectations for both masculinity and femininity. Um, so this kind of moves beyond this idea that, that gender is just um, a difference that's physiological to the idea that gender is something that is actually, um, it's actually done, it's actually performed. Um, and so that really helps to shed light on the idea that it's not just a natural thing. So that leads us to the idea of gender as performance, which is again kind of a groundbreaking idea within the sociology of gender, that we perform particular gender roles, um, that we perform particular kinds of jobs when, within society, um, and that through that our gender is kind of being constructed all the time. And so as we, as we referred to earlier, um, in the past this has often been thought of in terms of, you know, um, the housewife um, or the male breadwinner. And of course that's changed over time. But I wonder to what extent some of those legacies of the ways in which gender has been constructed so powerfully within our society lingers on in terms of our imagination of what it is appropriate to be and to do. Um, so that's a question I want to leave you thinking about yourselves. So there might be like lots of reasons for the changes um, that have happened in um, recent decades, the evolving labor market, um, the expansion of a working class, the idea that um, that there, there um, is less, um, not the idea, the reality, sorry, that there's less um, full-time permanent work and more casualized work, which has affected the, the possibility even of the male breadwinner, um, that the idea that we have to have several careers in a lifetime, which disrupts the idea of a job for life um, that a male breadwinner would, would have to support his family, um, and that's moved into kind of um, the idea that um, families, uh, both partners need to work within a family to, to make ends meet. Um, also that there's the rise in cost of living, which is, which, which is um, connected to what I just said. Um, access to birth control and family planning has been really important for women to be able to participate in the labor market, for example, and also in education. Um, and that's made change. And of course, feminism itself has made incredible strides. And I think that's really important to acknowledge and to celebrate that actually that comes from now decades of real hard struggle um, of feminists in um, trying to affect change um, for gender equity.
Of course, again, gender equity might mean different things for different people, and there might be different reasons for people to engage in, in that kind of struggle. Um, however, despite these changes, and this is coming back to my point about the lingering of particular powerful notions of the division of labor in society, um, there are still ongoing trends of gender inequality. So women's full-time wages are still around only 80% of men's wages. And women continue to be concentrated in um, sales, service, clerical sectors, and also nursing and, and teaching. And all of those sectors tend to be lower paid um, than the, the sectors in which men are concentrated and have fewer uh, career opportunities. Also, very few women occupy senior managerial positions. Um, I'm not sure what the current statistic is. I'm a professor um, myself, and there are, I mean, the last time I looked at the statistics, I think there were about 19% um, of, of professors are women, 19%. So, I mean, I think that that's quite a staggering. It might have grown now to 21%, I'm not sure. But that's quite a staggering statistic that helps to show that women still are very underrepresented in the most senior positions in our social institutions. And interestingly, in relation to other countries that share similar levels of affluence and educational standards, Australia continues to have high levels of gender segregation in both work and in leisure. And also, in relationship to that, overall, um, research shows that Australians tend to believe that this is a, nat that this is a natural phenomenon. Um, and are often shocked to visit other countries where this segregation is not as profound. Um, and the work and leisure of men and women is valued differently um, in Australia. So, um, you know, there's, there are these lingering kinds of um, trends that um, help us to recognize the importance of studying gender, that um, as much as we might want to claim that uh, we have an equitable society, that there are still patterns of inequality at play um, that are quite profound that we need to we need to continue to consider. Um, and with um, low paid work often comes also insecure work, low status work, low paid work. Um, and often women have to take up those kinds of jobs because they continue to have the responsibility to juggle family um, responsibilities as well as paid work, so unpaid and paid work. Um, and, you know, in Australian culture, largely speaking, men are just not expected to make the same kinds of sacrifices and adjustments. It's just not as explicit um, in terms of the ways that that's expected of women, or women expect that of themselves through these processes that we've talked about of, social, of socialization. And relatively speaking, Australian men do very little housework and not very much childcare. So I think that this is quite interesting. Women working full-time do a lot more housework than men. So that's women who are working full-time, um, are doing 15 hours more domestic work compared to men. OK, so I'm going to stop there, actually. And we're going to now have a bit of a break um, for 10 minutes. And we'll come back. Um, at quarter past one.
Okay, I'm going to bring everybody back again. So in this next part, we're just going to be building on some of the things that we talked about in the first part, but um, really getting into some of the theoretical perspectives in, in some more detail. So we're going to start with thinking about working within gender studies that's focused on um, masculinities, and um, masculinities as plural is a really important part of this um, uh, kind of set of insights that emerge from this part of gender studies, and it's really impacted in, I think, um, wider ways in terms of other forms of um, gender studies. Um, and what's important about it is, is the idea that there is no one masculinity. So we've talked about stereotypes, but the ways in which we actually express masculinity in society is multiple, and it's contested over, and it's not just one thing. And it's also subject to change. And if we look historically, um, say in one society, in Australian society, for example, even in one, within that one society, we'll be able to see that the expression of masculinity um, has changed over time. But also, if we look at different forms of masculinity across different cultures and societies, we'll see very different expressions of, of masculinity at play. So it's a very important insight that um, Raywin Connell has brought to, and it's been built on by many other theorists, uh, um, into view about the way in which we think about masculinities. Um, what Raywin argues, though, is that um, dominant definitions of masculinity are also important to hold on to. So although there are multiple forms of masculinity, um, there are certain forms of masculinity that carry status or carry esteem or privileges within a particular context or social site. So again, that may not be the same in every social site, um, but it might be of importance to look very carefully within that particular context about what forms of masculinity um, hold power, hold esteem, hold um, status within a particular social institution or social um, context. Um, thinking about masculinities helps um, by looking at, say, images, um, of masculinities, um, different texts. So, for example, you might look at that in terms of policy texts or in terms of media texts, the way that um, masculinity is being portrayed within newspapers, different kinds of newspapers or the media, um, and also practices themselves. So you might want to study the practice of masculinities within a social site like um, higher education or, um, or going to um, leisure sort of sites like, um, for example, the gym, for example, or um, uh, looking at different kinds of um, popular culture sites in which masculinities might be expressed in particular kinds of ways. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we might study from a sociological perspective masculinities. In thinking about the notion of dominance, um, a very important concept is this concept of hegemonic or hege hegemony, um, which helps us, instead of thinking about dominance, because the word dominance tends to make us think about something that's quite fixed, and that idea of power as being held by one group and not another. So the idea that men have power and women don't, which is rather simplistic. Um, because it doesn't actually um, understand or, or try to address the differences between and within men and also the differences um, between women, for example. So hegemony, the idea of hege hegemony, helps us to think about how power plays out in a more fluid way 
and that um, power is not asserted just by um, violence, for example, or um, explicit forms of power and regulation and control, but often much more subtly through the kinds of ways we've been talking about through, for example, the way that um, gender and masculinity is being portrayed in the media, um, or the ways in which, if you think about um, uh, the labor market, how particular forms of masculinity might be embedded in job uh, uh, position descriptions, for example, the kinds of attributes that are being valued within those roles. Um, and I've been really interested in how leadership is being constructed within higher education and the kinds of forms um, of leadership that are being valued that are, are often tied in with those histories around um, masculine stereotypes of strength, logic, rationality, assertiveness, competition, and so on um, that have implications for women taking up leadership roles, for example, and men as well, because it means that people are locked into um, displaying these particular kinds of hegemonic forms of masculinity that are given value and esteem within these social spaces. Um, but also what's really important about thinking about masculinities in relation to hegemony is the idea that not all men directly benefit from hegemonic forms of masculinity. So it means that men have to conform to those hegemonic masculinities. Um, and also their bodies have to be read off as, um, uh, I guess, taking up those forms of hegemonic masculinity. So hegemony is not the same as dominance. Um, it's not something that's once and for all a fixed thing. It doesn't have a notion of power that is fixed in time. It's the idea that we struggle over power and that power is linked to indicators of esteem or indicators of value within society um, that take the doing of it, the take, take the practice of it to be recognizable as a form of um, hegemony. So you might think of examples as being CEOs, sports stars, um, you know, Supreme Court judges. They're all quite different in the, in the ways in which they perform masculinity. Um, but within those social spaces, within those social sites, you can see, if you analyze the different forms of masculinity, that there are commonalities around the hegemonic forms uh, within those, those different contexts of being a sports star versus being a Supreme Court judge and so on. So here are some examples of images that might be really familiar to you of the kinds of expressions of masculinity within contemporary society. Um, so they are very different images of masculinity, but they hold hege hegemony within those kinds of social sites. So the point about this to hold on to is the idea that masculinity is always a contested site. It's not a once and for all. Um, it's fluid. Um, it's responsive to trends in social movements. It makes and remakes itself. And individual people will express their identities in relation to or even against in resistance to uh, those hegemonic forms of masculinity at play. And again, as we talked about stereotypes, real people don't just simply occupy those positions in a kind of perfect way. It doesn't work that way. Um, so, you know, we may have kind of ideal notions of hegemonic masculinities within those social sites. That doesn't mean any one individual just takes up those positions in a, in, in a way that um, is, is completely pure. Um, there's a kind of dynamism to the ways in which different men take up and respond to and negotiate uh, those different kinds of expressions of masculinity at play within the workplace, within the family, um, uh, within schools, um, and, and so on. Um, 
But men are not only organized hierarchically in relation to women. I think the important point about the study of masculinity is it disrupts that view of power as being held only by one group against another. This idea that, you know, um, gender is almost like class. There's a, a class conflict between men and women. The idea is that also um, there are hierarchies between men as well. Um, and different men benefit differently from hegemonic masculinity. Some men are completely excluded from uh, those forms of hegemonic masculinity. And men who are read as effeminate, for example, or whose gender and sexuality might differ from the hegemonic ideal within those social spaces will often experience marginalization. So it's a way to draw attention to the way that gender plays out to not only marginalize some groups of women, but also some groups of men as well. That gender is much more complex than simply a crude analysis of um, a battle of the sexes. Um, and that's what gender studies helps to kind of bring to light. However, Connell does argue that to some extent, all men receive some measure of um, what she calls the patriarchal dividend, um, which means that although um, some groups of men benefit more from patriarchy, other groups of men don't, um, all men will to some extent be able to draw from some aspect of the patriarchal dividend against other groups who are marginalized within those social sites. So an example um, of the way in which hegemonic masculinity might play out um, in different kinds of ways might be this case study um, which looks at how geek masculinity um, within the Gamergate and, um, uh, kind of context um, has a particular form of hegemony which keeps um, boys and men um, in a position to be able to claim technological knowledge and aptitude as a basis for masculine identity. And that is an example of how geek masculinity, which might differ very much from the other kinds of forms of stereotypical masculinity that we've looked at, help towards that kind of patriarchal dividend within this particular site. So what do we mean by the patriarchal dividend? Well, first of all, we have to understand what patriarchy is to understand the patriarchal dividend. So we very briefly talked about patriarchy as being a social structure um, in which historically um, men have had more power within society than women have. So it's kind of an overarching social structure that ensures the um, privileging of particular forms of masculinity, those masculine stereotypes that are preferred within um, influential and senior positions over those attributes that are associated with femininity. So being hard, being tough, being assertive, being rational, being strong, being able to defend, all of those kinds of things um, that we talked about around stereotypes are often used in a kind of neutral way without mentioning gender as a way to argue for particular kinds of people to take up those senior positions or those influential positions in society. Um, and in relationship to this notion then of the patriarchal dividend, an example is that men collectively receive the bulk of income and the money in the financial economy and also, as we've already talked about, occupy most of the senior or managerial positions in society. Interesting, we, uh, interestingly, I think most of us are aware that um, men um, hold the most senior roles in politics. So men hold nine out of 10 cabinet level positions in national governments, um, nearly as many of the parliamentary seats, and most top positions in international agencies. So this is an example 
where sociology can kind of reveal um, the structures in which there is an ongoing patriarchal dividend. But that doesn't mean all men are benefiting in the same way from that patriarchal dividend. It's not equally distributed amongst men, um, but it is unequally distributed between men and women. And men also receive the benefits of a great deal of unpaid household labor. So where they're doing less housework or they're freer to be able to um, develop their careers, be um, mobile across spaces to take up different positions, um, and so on, or also a benefit from the emotional support um, from women, um, that might be another example of the patriarchal dividend, particularly in the case of heterosexual relationships. So we can see that gender and sexuality are really entwined, and it's really important in gender studies to hold the two kind of together to understand how the construction of gender um, also is a very powerful mechanism in the construction of heterosexual normativity. Um, patriarchy, patriarchy is also not exclusively defined as relations um, between men and women. Um, and as I've already said, it's not always in the interests of the majority of men. And it's really important to think about this again, just to remind you about the difference between, for example, the way psychologists and sociologists would look at gender. Sociologists are really interested in this from a social perspective. So although they're interested in how that plays out in terms of the micro level of social interactions and identity um, formation, they're interested in that in relation to wider social um, contexts, social structures, social systems, social institutions, um, language, patterns, the symbols um, that might be around us that reinforce sometimes really implicitly um, gendered assumptions or gendered stereotypes, gendered sociali uh, socialization processes. Um, and it's also important that you know, women also generate, exercise, have access to forms of power. So you know, contemporary gender studies is less likely to argue a crude sort of difference between men and women and a battle of the sexes and more an understanding about how as people we engage with the politics of gender. We negotiate those different gender rules, regulatory practices, institutions, um, and that women also can gain power um, within patriarchal systems, sometimes by association with powerful males but also, I would argue, by themselves taking up some of those historically masculine attributes that we talked about. So women can also perform themselves within those hegemonic masculinities. It's more difficult for them to do um, because they have to, in a way, arguably work harder to be read off from the lens of um, hegemonic masculinity. But women can take up leadership positions and they can take up those kinds of practices around hegemonic masculinities. So, you know, just thinking back to what those attributes are, those stereotypes of being assertive, being competitive, being strong, being rational, and so on, all of those signifiers um, of some forms of hegemonic masculinity. Um, patriarchy as a concept has been challenged um, for not necessarily being able to acknowledge the notion of intersectionality. Um, and so, you know, too rigid in terms of uh, its analysis that this is the, the structure um, that is the most important one to understand uh, the ways in which our identities are formed. That, for example, it might not be able to recognize how race and ethnicity um, shape our identities and shape um, social systems and structures and 
um, cultural histories of oppression and marginalization and so on, or age, for example, or religion, or all sorts of differences that play out to make a difference in our lives. So increasingly, um, gender uh, theorists have been looking towards notions of intersectionality to have a more nuanced um, analysis of how gender plays out. Um, that doesn't mean, I don't, I don't personally think we give up on the notion of patriarchy. The way that I think about patriarchy is that patriarchy is one social force that works very, in very complex, sorry, complex ways with other social forces um, to create um, mechanisms of power in our, in our society. So it doesn't operate by itself. It's not just one overarching political force, but there might be many different forces at play um, that shape um, power dynamics in our society. So let's talk about feminism. Um, so feminism is really important. Um, sorry, just make sure I haven't skipped a slide. Um, as it advocates social equality for the sexes, it's been an important, not only theoretical framework, but also movement. So um, feminism is often not just about scholarship and about theory, but also about activism and change. And many feminist um, theorists and scholars would also see themselves as activists um, and see those as very much interlinking. Um, and I think that's really important to, to recognize um, because sociology could be seen as a description um, of how society is. I think feminists would position themselves more than that, is trying to understand how society is structured, um, how power works within our society, and also through that advocate for social change. Um, I think that, you know, there's been uh, times when there's been a real kind of explicit backlash against feminism, and um, there has been times when it's been almost dangerous to actually identify yourself as a feminist. I still feel that that's the case sometimes in certain social situations where I'm less likely to say, um, to kind of identify myself as a feminist scholar and I might say I'm a sociologist of gender because there's a political aspect to um, identifying yourself as a feminist because of those kind of contestations and struggles against feminism. And of course there would be a whole range of reasons why there would be a struggle against feminism. Um, but one argument might be that it is a, um, it's a deliberate strategy to maintain power within social institutions. In any case, what's really important is that feminism is not about female supremacy. You know, all of the kinds of um, derogatory ways of thinking about feminism in the past, about, you know, feminists hate men or feminists are against men, um, and that is completely flawed and problematic, that, um, you know, feminism is actually about struggling for um, equality and, and social justice amongst people, um, provides a really nuanced understanding of how power works and also sheds light on and illuminates how gender is often taken for granted or is invisible in our social institutions and helps draw out um, and makes more apparent um, how gender works in our different social contexts. But basic feminist ideas might be, um, kind of away from feminist academic work, is that we should work towards um, increasing equality, that we should seek to expand human choices and opportunities, that we should elu eliminate gender stratification, that we should eliminate sexual co coercion and violence, and all of us should have the capacity to enjoy sexual freedom. So what are some of the um, key aspects? So there's Feminism is not just one thing. It's really important to understand that there's debates within feminism um, and that there have been also different waves of feminism. 
I can't give you all of the um, detail about different strands of feminist theory because we don't have time to do that. But if you're interested, then definitely do some reading around this. Um, but, but just to give you a kind of basic history, so first wave feminism emerged in the 19th and early 20th century and was really focused on women's suffrage. Um, so that was kind of the main focus of first wave feminism, as well as um, issues like access to, to higher education, which was a real issue for women in the times. Um, second wave feminism began in the 1960s, as I said earlier, and really focused on what might be viewed as the sexual revolution, but it also was interested in changing, um, changing, making change, helping to create change uh, through issues such as divorce, custody, marital rape, bringing that to the fore, um, issues around domestic violence, and also ensuring that women have access to um, re reproductive health and reproductive rights and rights over controlling their own bodies. Um, third wave feminism began in the early 1990s and is really focused, has been really focused around um, intersectional activism and trans feminism. So really thinking about what I had just said earlier about how um, different forms of um, of marginalization or exclusion um, or political social movements entwine and are not separate from feminist issues and that we need to work together and, and create understanding of how these differences are intersectional. And some might say that we are now in a period um, in, uh, around fourth wave feminism. Um, which is focused on contemporary issues such as street harassment, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, cultures of rape, so not just you know, foregrounding um, gender and sexual violence, but also thinking about that in terms of the cultures uh, within uh, different social institutions of rape, and also identity politics, so really focusing on um, disrupting notions of of a binary uh, gender understanding towards a much more nuanced set of identity politics. And of course, intersectionality has been really key around that to think about um, not only how different social differences matter in people's lives and they intersect in quite complex ways. So it's not just a, a kind of formula of you take, say, socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity, and you add that to gender, and you, that equals, you know, three times as much oppression as if you only have one uh, kind of difference. It's much more um, nuanced than that. It's about how um, these differences play out sometimes in quite unpredictable ways uh, within different social contexts, and that we're negotiating these different aspects of our identity all the time um, in these different social contexts but also coming back to the idea of patriarchy itself, that those social systems and social structures are also intersectional. So they play out in intersectional ways that shape our, our personal experiences of those differences. Um, so a much more kind of nuanced analysis of how social differences play out. Gender is still really important. Sexuality is still really important. Um, but understanding how um, those work with other social differences and inequalities. Um, and there are kind of the, the foundations of feminist theory have different strands. So again, this is not a comprehensive um, uh, study of all forms of feminist theory, but it helps, like you had last, uh, last week, understand the strands of feminist theory that emerged um, probably mainly, mainly through second wave feminism and then have developed and grown um, over time to form uh, new kinds of um, feminist theories and gender studies in contemporary times. So 
one of the fun, kind of foundational forms of feminist the, uh, theory is liberal feminism, and that still plays out. We can see it in higher education around gender equity policies, and really liberal feminists um, kind of look at the current system. They're less concerned with changing the current system and work they're more concerned with working within the current system to try to uh, look at how um, women can be uh, represented more equitably um, have access to resources more equitably and have access to more senior positions as well so um, they're not really about changing structures or changing society. They're more about working within the system to create change for individual women. Socialist feminism, kind of the, the foundations of that is through Marxism and neo-Marxism into ways of thinking about gender, that gender and capitalism are deeply entwined. So not just patriarchy, being an overarching system of um, marginalization and oppression, but also capitalism working as a form of oppression um, that plays out in certain ways with gender to, um, to uh, disadvantage women in particular. Um, so, for example, uh, socialist feminists would argue that monogamous forms of marriage are a form of, of capitalism, of, about private property, the idea that you enter into a contract um, in which a man owns uh, the woman and children uh, like they own wealth and possessions. And if you look at policy, for example, around domestic violence, you'll see how um, you can trace through some aspects of that uh, about how domestic violence was viewed and, and understood um, decades ago and how that's changed. So the family is seen as a microcosm of society's larger class relations, um, with the father kind of being the head of the family, um, having dominance over decision making in the family, and so on. And so patriarchy and capitalism must be seen as, as kind of entwined, deeply entwined. And then radical feminists, the third kind of strand of foundational feminist theory, um, is really interested in changing society and understanding um, that change through the lens of patriarchy being the overarching system of oppression of women. Um, so um, that, you know, even if a woman got into the public sphere, the argument would be that because of the patriarchal system, they would still have to play a particular game to be part of that club. And that particular game would be around the rules of, you know, being one of the boys. Um, so an example of that would be like the old boys club that you have to be, you know, in order to enter into influential situations, you might need to drink with the men or go to the men's clubs and so on. And I think it's quite interesting that the Newcastle Club um, actually only allowed women in, what, about 15 years ago? I'm not quite sure exactly the time period, but I think that's really interesting. Um, but also that radical feminists have been really interested in the private sphere and, you know, trying to make change around how um, the private sphere is one in which uh, women uh, experience um, sexual assault, domestic violence, and so on. And the notion that that's private and that's just between a, a man and his wife um, is, is a way of hiding and concealing the power that happens within the family. So just as sex and gender are distinctive within the sociology of, of gender and sexuality, sexuality is also distinctive in terms of the concept. So sexual, sexuality describes sexual orientation, um, sexual identity, sexual practice, um, and sexuality indeed continues to be regulated by a variety of legal and policing mechanisms in our society. Um, some cultures in our society attempt to regulate all aspects of sexuality. Um, and so, you know, that is where kind of 
heteronormativity um, is reinforced and reproduced. Um, Judith Butler is a really significant figure in um, studying so gender and sociology, uh, sorry, gender and sexuality, um, and has developed queer theory. And queer theory is really important in shedding light on uh, the ways that heterosexuality has been over time and continues to be constructed as normal uh, within some societies. Um, queer theory challenges that traditional divide between gay and heterosexual, heterosexual, suggesting that sexual identity is fluid across different stages of life and sex gender. So in other words, again, it's the study of sexuality that constructs it as not fixed once and for all, but something that we continuously engage with, um, that we um, produce over time, um, that is fluid across our lives and across, um, across culture as well. So if you aren't familiar with Judith Butler, she has loads of YouTube videos, and she's such a great speaker. And I would really encourage you to just go on and search Judith Butler and listen to her speak, because she's just fantastic to hear speak. Um, and although there have been political shifts in recent times, um, one, of the, one of the kinds of arguments against the current frame is that there's a sense of assimilation um, going on that really is still holding up the heterosexual kind of normative view um, that, you know, kind of all people are the same and you sort of fit into the heterosexual um, framework. Um, but there's a kind of an acceptance of other ways of um, expressing your sexual identity, but not really shifting in terms of disrupting that heterosexual normative view of the world. Michel Foucault was absolutely significant scholar in trying to uncover the ways that taken for granted notions have structured society over time. And one of the areas of his focus was sexuality. Um, and he w it was a very important piece of work, History of Sexuality, because it helps to uncover how the ways in which we, again, think he he uh, sexuality is this kind of normalized thing, um, that actually there have been many different kinds of ways of thinking about sexuality over time. I'm going to skip over that. Um, but the, the important thing is the idea that sexuality is not fixed, um, it's on a spectrum, um, and that um, we might shift over time and space, both as a culture but also as individuals and in the way in which we position ourselves on that spectrum. The idea of gender diversity is that um, the idea that some of these kinds of links between sex and sexuality and gender are completely arbitrary. In other words, there are no intrinsic gendered qualities, and that's a really important point, that there's no link between sex and sexuality, even though that, that is how it's constructed around heterosexual normativity. So that means that a broader range of expressions of sexual identity must be possible. It kind of opens up and unlocks the way that we think about sexuality in such rigid ways. Um, it also helps to think about the distinction between gender identity, romantic attraction, physical sex characteristics, and gender presentation um, as distinctive as well. And it also brings attention to what the ways that sexuality and gender has been fluid over time and space, that it isn't fixed, that there are other ways of expressing it, and that if we study this historically, we'll see that there are different ways of organizing sex and sexuality and gender within um, different cultures and different historical times. So these are kind of the points of summary um, that you should pay attention to. I hope that this has been a helpful lecture to um, introduce you to some of these ideas. I hope that you want to take them up further and do some more reading. Thank you very much.
You go to the next icon up. Oh, okay. And then goes. Oh, no power options available. Yeah. If we go Control Alt Delete, if you're familiar with that. Control Alt and then Delete. It should be in there. Uh, this one. Uh, no, delete. So this. Sorry. And then go Sign Out. Okay. Thank and you're you. Done. I'm I'm a Mac user, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're used to things Thank that you. actually work. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so embarrassing, but Not you get all. so used to. You know, a particular. I'll get out of the way. Oh, no. It's okay. Plenty of time, I think, here. That's still four or five minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> so you're with us the, the whole semester? Um, no, no. You were just, you were just well, guesting no, today? I'm, I'm just guesting for this course. Okay. And I, I, I'm actually the director of the Center of Excellence for Equity in Higher Education. Fantastic. So I haven't done a lot of Oh, like riding a bike. Like riding it was really good. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, they seemed animated when they were walking out, so well done. You didn't put them to sleep. 